good morning or afternoon and welcome to this Tech Talk webinar, Introduction to QoS for Collaboration. Uh, my name is Maren Mahoney. I'm an instructor here at Sunset Learning. Um, and the, the overall purpose of this particular Tech Talk is to get you familiar with the terms surrounding QoS and the, the, the basic concepts. Um, we're going to be specifically talking about uh, the mechanisms that routers and switches use to do uh, to do QoS itself, but I'm going to talk a little bit about you know what is QoS and um, the fact that QoS is really an umbrella term. So there we go. So actually, let me just go ahead and start talking about that. So QoS, quality of service, is the idea that we need to give our infrastructure the intelligence to understand the different kinds of traffic that are flowing and to make smart decisions about it. And QoS itself really is an umbrella term. Um, it, you know, people think about QoS with regards to configuring a router or configuring a switch with like a you know policy map or something like that. But if you think about, especially in collaboration, things like just call admission control in call manager, that is a QoS concept. So there's not just one thing that is QoS. There's a lot of things that are QoS. My goal for you for this uh, session is to understand basically these terms and these concepts. What is classification and marking and why do we care? What is queuing and why do we care? You'll hear about policing and shaping. And I want you to know again, what those terms mean in the, the larger context of QoS. And then specifically, if you run around in collaboration, you'll uh, hear the term low latency queuing or LLQ. And I want you to know what that means along with class-based weighted fair queuing, which we will also talk about. And then towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, QoS is accomplished in the switch um, as well. So here we go. And uh, this particular session, I don't really have slides per se. What I have, I, I, I'm just going to talk about everything. Um, if you have questions as we go through the conversation, please feel free to just shout out um, the, the, the question. Um, if you do send me a chat, know that I don't get any notification of that. I don't get a bing. So just speak up and interrupt me. I'm totally okay with that. All right. So let's start by talking about how a router will process traffic. So I have a, you know, I have a router here, right? And that router is going to have some kind of an egress interface, whether that is, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, an Ethernet interface with a gig link, or whether that's a, you know, any kind of uh, interface that's going to ingress and egress traffic. Now, the um, the the actual port, the actual physical port on a router, has a queue in it. It has a, a buffer. which is effectively a queue. And what we're talking about here is remember that there's going to be a wire. I mean, this is, sounds kind of simplistic, but there's a wire hanging off of this port and the router needs to be able to put the ones and zeros, put the traffic onto the wire. So what the hardware buffer does, this is a hardware buffer, hardware queue, is it is the holding place for the next bits that are going to be fed onto the wire. Now, depending, depending on the speed of this port, is it a 40 gig port, a 10 gig port, a, a 100 meg port in the cases of Ethernet, um, that tells you how many bits can get put onto that, that wire at any you know, given interval. So piece of traffic comes into your router. Your router looks through the routing table or whatever else, selects an egress interface, and let's say it's this egress interface, if there's room in the hardware queue, the hardware buffer, the router will just put that traffic into the hardware queue and it will go next. And that is, um, uh, you know, the, the default behavior. So traffic, though, is bursty. So if I am offering traffic to this egress interface slowly, then this hardware queue is never going to get full. I'll always be able to have room and it just first in, first out. It'll just feed it out, feed it out. But traffic is bursty. So I get a bunch of traffic that all has to go out this egress interface. And now this hardware queue gets full. Now what? When we talk about queuing in the context of quality of service, what we're talking about is what does the router do now? When we talk about queues, that's what we're talking about. 
Now, in you know, in a, a default environment, what will happen is that the router will line up that traffic. You know, part one, part you know, traffic piece number one, past traffic piece number two, traffic piece number three, and one by one, as you know, traffic leaves this interface and there's room in the hardware buffer, the the router will be the first piece of traffic in, and then the second piece of traffic, and the third piece of traffic. There is a software queue that the router holds onto. It can hold a certain amount of traffic. And on a first in, first out basis, the router will just feed the stuff out. And that is a QoS style. And when we talk about a quality of service, first in, first out, or best effort is the, the, um, the way of it. Now, there's two pro problems with that. Problem number one is, from a QoS perspective, we may want to see to it that let's say this, this piece number three here, we want to see that this piece number three goes first. It needs to have less delay. Voice traffic is a good example of that. So what I need to do is get my router to pay attention to the different kinds of traffic and choose of the traffic that's waiting, which piece of traffic should go next. It, it should be noted that no matter what I do in the router, from a quality of service configuration perspective. If this hardware queue never gets full, none of these mechanisms do anything really. You're just, you know, the, the next piece of traffic that's offered to the interface goes into the hardware queue because there's room and goes out, no delay. They call that wire speed. It is only when this hardware queue gets full that we start talking about these things. So problem number one is, um, you know, of the traffic that's waiting, can I get the router to pay attention to the different kinds of traffic and choose which one goes next? And problem number two is, how big can that software buffer be? Can I make it small? Can I make it large? And importantly, what happens if the software buffer gets full? Then what? The short answer for that, by the way, if the hardware buffer is full, and the software queuing becomes full, there's no more room in it, the next piece of traffic that's offered to that interface gets dropped and it goes into the bit bucket and will have to be retransmitted in the case of TCP traffic. And sometimes, especially with important traffic, we want to avoid that. And I think, you know, in collaboration environments, um, your RTP traffic is a perfect example of that. We don't want RTP traffic to get dropped and we don't want it to get delayed. So if your RTP traffic is, you know, this piece of traffic number three, we want to A, make sure it goes into the hardware buffer next, and B, if a ne the next piece of traffic that gets offered to this queue is RTP traffic, we don't want it to get dropped. So how do we go about accomplishing this? This is the underlying idea of QoS. So, so far, so good. Any questions so far? Thumbs, nods, oh yes. <laughs> so far, so good. Thank so you. So far, so good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So then, what are we talking about here? The next kind of thing we want to talk about is classification and marking. What is classification and marking? Classification and marking is where we're going to start having the, the router pay attention to the different kinds of traffic. So kinds of traffic might be real time traffic. And an example of that might be your RTP traffic. I might have what they call interactive traffic. And an example of that might be video. Right. People are fairly tolerant of uh, bad video. You know, if a video doesn't look quite as good, but as long as it sounds OK, we're fine. You know, if we're in a video call and that's very, very true. Um, but we still want it to be, you know, sent before other things. Another example of interactive traffic might be if I am interacting with a piece of software across the network and I want you know, real time response or high, you know, response times, good response times for that traffic. And then there's transactional traffic. 
And transactional traffic would be things like I send a query to a SQL server or, and I'm, I'm waiting for a response, but if it takes a couple of seconds for it to crunch it and send it back, like, yeah, whatever. Or I want to you know, transfer a file or send an email. I am interacting with the network and I'm interacting maybe with applications, but I, I, I'm not like, it's not time sensitive on a response. It's, I'm not waiting, like literally waiting and watching for this response to come back necessarily. And then there is other kinds of just best, um, best effort traffic. Uh, and then final category might be scavenger, scavenger. And an example of scavenger traffic might be things like, you know, your uh, employees are surfing Amazon.com on their lunch hour. Do I want that traffic to go through? Oh, yeah. I want my employees to be able to do the things that they want to do, especially on their own free time, even though it's working with my network. Um, because if I like block Amazon.com altogether, my employees might be upset. And that's a, that's a quality of, of life issue for employees um you know and that's the kind of thing that will make them leave the company and hiring people's expensive so let's give them some i don't necessarily need to make it a high response time if it's a little slow okay so when we're talking about classification and marking the very very first thing you need to do is do an analysis of the traffic that's running on your network to determine what's there this is a step that many uh, companies are not necessarily willing to pay for or to wait for uh, because they think, oh, you know, I know what's running on my network. And most people have absolutely no idea. They are shocked at the kinds of traffic that might be flowing over their network. So step one, you always want to do a good traffic analysis. And then number two, from a business perspective, you're going to want to look at the different kinds of traffic and decide from a business perspective what is important, what is less important, what is not important. And then from a technology perspective, what is high priority and what is low priority? Your real-time traffic, generally speaking, needs to come in a very high, uh, you know, high response time, low uh, uh, traffic drop, low delay, right? That, that's really important. And RTP traffic is a perfect example of that. My interactive traffic, right? Um, this, I want to make sure it goes through, but I don't want so much video on my network that it starts taking up all the bandwidth. So how do I see to it that I have high response times for my video, but only up to a certain point? And if the router has to make a choice between a piece of voice traffic and a piece of video traffic, how do I get it to pick one versus the other? What we want to do is classify the traffic, business purposes, technology purposes, and determine for different kinds of traffic uh, what the overall priority is. And then you're gonna mark that traffic. And by that, I mean this. If you have a Cisco IP phone and that is connected to a switch, and let's say that switch is connected to a router, and then I've got my, you know, the rest of my network there. Um, the switch itself is going to have the ability to prioritize what goes on the uplink uh, over the trunk to the router. So we want to, the, the switch to be able to make those kinds of choices. And then we want to make sure that the router is able to distinguish between different kinds of traffic so that we can send it into the network and the network can handle it. So classifying traffic is one thing. But how do I tell the network what class a particular piece of traffic is in? That's what marking's about. In the a session later on today, I'm going to be talking about uh, DSCP, Differentiated Services Code Point, DSCP. This is a field, a byte, in the IP header. It's called the toss byte, the type of service byte. And it is eight bits that we use. We actually only use five of them practically. Um, but we use these bits to mark the traffic. The, your Cisco IP phone will, for any piece of RTP traffic it generates, it will reach into the DSCP 
the toss byte, those, those values in the IP header as it's generating the RTP traffic and put a certain marking there. It will change these bits to um, expedited forwarding is what that actually is, those particular set of markings. And then it will send that piece of traffic out on the wire and it'll go to the switch, it'll go to the router. And at that point, the router can say, oh, I see that this piece of incoming traffic has this marking already on it. I know what to do with this piece of traffic. Let me go ahead and implement my QoS policy based on that mark. There is uh, the, the, the Cisco IP phone, and this is true for all IP phones really, will mark their RTP traffic expedited forwarding EF, and it will mark um, the traffic, let's do, do a different configuration of that toss byte, those bits, to do something called AF41 for video, and then AF31. And we'll talk about what these values mean in the session this afternoon, but AF31 for things like signaling. The fact that the phone itself is going to mark the traffic, it's going to modify the IP header, and that IP header then does not necessarily get modified as it flows through the rest of the network. The phone is going to mark that piece of traffic with these bits, a certain configuration. Downstream devices can just look at those bits and know what to do. Well, what about other kinds of traffic? You know, if I'm, you know, talking to a SQL server, you know, my PC is not going to be marking that kind of traffic. How do I get other traffic classes to exist? How do I get the other types of traffic to be identified and to be marked? Classification is about identifying. Marking is about putting a, a label on a piece of traffic. This is done um, mostly at the switch or at the routers. You can do a certain amount at the switch, but the router mostly. Access control lists. Hey, Anything that's going to this server, which happens to be the SQL server, I want to put into a particular pot um, of traffic that's going to be handled similarly. And I'm going to put this marking on it. Any traffic that's going to my email server, I'm going to put into this pot of traffic and put this kind of marking on it. And with these kinds, and there, there's, you know, I can do, um, uh, from and to IP addresses, to and from MAC addresses. Um, if you're running MPLS, you can you look at the, um, the uh, ex uh, ex um, experimental bit. If you're doing frame relay, hopefully you're not anymore. The DE bit, if you're looking at um, Ethernet traffic, there's a header in the 802.1Q header, um, the, you know, the, the, the tag frame, the VLAN tag frame. Um, the, the switch itself can have uh, class of service bits. There's three bits where I can mark traffic. And what this means is the router using subnets, IP addresses, MAC addresses, other kinds of markings that's already on the traffic. The router itself can do the classification. And based on which class a particular piece of traffic has, has been put into, which pot it has put into, the router will then mark the traffic. And it will go into that toss byte in the IP header and mark the traffic. At that point, once the first place I can manage happens to go in and go and do this marking, as the traffic now goes downstream in my network, downstream devices don't have to do the full evaluation. They don't have to worry about access control lists or you know deep diving into uh, types of traffic or anything like that. They can just go, oh, I see this marking, uh, let me go do this. So it makes it very easy for downstream devices to identify which, you know, the different kinds of traffic that should go in their queues. So classification and marking is the identifying and marking of traffic so that in a QoS environment, it is easy for networking infrastructure devices to know what to do. Generally speaking, you're going to want to do classification and marking as close to the source of traffic as possible, which is why your phones do their own marking. At layer three, they do DSCP. And again, there's three bits in the 802.1Q header, the VLAN tag header, um, and the phone marks that too, which allows the switch to do a certain amount of work. So far, so good with regards to classification and marking. Questions, issues? I have a question. Yes, sir. Does the marking also happen on soft phones like Jabber? 
What an excellent question. Potentially. <laughs> okay. So I will say that um, the interaction between your Jabber client and the IP stack in your PC, you know, as the, the, um, the, the, the piece of software hands information off, um, it can tell the IP stack to mark the, the IP header a certain way. So yes, the, the, the traffic itself coming out of a Jabber client at layer three will have the DSCP values. So that's layer three. Okay. What about layer two? What about that 802.1 QTAC? Now, in the case of a Cisco IP phone, I'm going to be physically connected, and that's true for IP communicator too, by the way, I'm going to be physically connected to the switch, so I'm going to have to create the Ethernet header, including a VLAN tag to send to the switch, so the phone itself can mark that layer two, too. But what about a PC daisy chained off of that phone? Can a PC reach into the layer two header, the Ethernet header, and mark those three bits, the class of service bits, maybe. NICS network control, card, network, the, the NICS, the, the network cards, in a PC, modern ones, um, are VLAN aware. And if you have a modern NIC, it is very possible that based again on how the, the networking stack um, is configured in your PC, that the NIC itself will mark um, at layer two those the, the, the uh, class of service bits. That's that's less common. And because that gets stripped off basically, well, no, it doesn't really get stripped off by the switch, but it'll get stripped off by the router. So the router would have to be told to go pay attention to that, but it can. Um, uh, so it, the, the, the PC may be able to also mark it at layer two. The phone certainly will mark its own traffic at layer two. The switch can be told to pay attention to those layer two markings, for instance, what goes on the uplink first. The router certainly will uh, be able to use those layer two markings to do its business. Does that answer the question you're asking, Javier? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. OK. All right. So we have talked about why we do QoS. And we have talked about classification and marking, which is really the first step. Until you identify traffic, you can't do any kind of differentiation of treatment. And the reason we mark is so that not every single hop in my network has to do the classification because it takes time. It takes time and juice on your routers to do this. So we want to classify and then mark traffic as close to the source as possible. Well, OK, then. Now that we know that we can classify and mark traffic. So we're going to have different classes of traffic. Now let's talk about that hardware queue again, and then what gets fed into that hardware queue. So getting back to my router again. Right, with the wire. As I mentioned before, your router is going to feed traffic into the hardware queue, and then whatever gets fed into the hardware queue goes next, just period. If I don't offer traffic to this hardware queue faster than it can make stuff go out, basically, if this never fills up, I don't, you know, the, any kind of QoS configuration I have on my router really is kind of irrelevant, at least for egress traffic, because it's just, you know, I, I get it in, I send it out, and off it goes. It is only when we start queuing traffic in the software that we start being a, uh, have the router really start paying attention to and treat traffic differently based on those classes. So I can have classes. Um, let's say again, I've got um, uh, real-time traffic like RTP. I've got interact interactive traffic like video. I've got my transactional traffic um, like, um, you know, SQL queries or whatnot. I've got, um, um, I've got uh, file transfer, whatever, and then I've got scavenger. Okay. So the router has received the traffic. It's gone in and determined which category, which class a particular piece of traffic belongs into. And it's gone in and done the marking part. 
traffic is being offered to this egress interface faster than the stuff can leave, so I am queuing. What I want to do in QoS is determine of these different classes of traffic, which one, because there might be you know, pieces of traffic in each one, which one gets serviced first? Out of which one of these categories of traffic do I want to take the next piece of traffic to get fed into this egress interface? When we talk about queuing, this is what we're talking about. So one kind of trap, what kind of queuing is called priority queuing. Or PQ. Priority queuing allows me to say, hey, this real time traffic, this is the first thing that you get serviced. If there is a piece of traffic in this queue, it should always go next into this egress interface period full stop. So there's traffic in the roll time queue. I have room in the, the hardware queue. The rider will go into this group of traffic, take the next piece of traffic, feed it into the hardware interface. Then it goes back and says, is there another piece of traffic in that queue? There is, let me feed it out. Once this queue, this first queue is completely empty, 100%, there is no more traffic here. The router will go to the second category of traffic and send one piece. And then it will go back to the first, the first queue and say, hey, is there any traffic here? Let's go. So I, I empty the first queue. Once I empty the first queue, one piece of traffic out of the second queue is sent. And then I go back and I check the first queue again. If that's empty, I send another piece of traffic out of the second queue. And then I go back to the first queue. And I keep doing this and I keep doing this. Note what's happening to these other queues though, they're getting starved. This third queue, only if there is zero traffic remaining to be sent in queue number one and zero traffic remaining to be sent in queue number two, only then will the router go to this third queue and send one piece of traffic and then go back to the first two queues to see if there's any traffic. This is priority queuing. For voice, that's awesome. Because with voice traffic, we always want it to go first. I've got a you know 150 millisecond one way delay budget, less than 1% packet loss, no more than 30 milliseconds of jitter. That's standard, you know, voice traffic RTP um, QoS parameters. My voice traffic's gonna sound awesome. Now my video is probably going to be okay, but it's very easy to see where these other queues are going to get starved. We're not going to have um, a turns given to queue number four, queue number five. And even if I do get a queue, as soon as other, you know higher priority traffic is sent, then you know this has to wait some more. Could it be that people surfing Amazon.com is now so slow that people give up? And then they leave my company because the internet stinks. Yeah, that totally can happen. So priority queuing is kind of a bad idea. And we don't do this in a production environment. Okay, well, what other options are there? Another option is called class based weighted fair queuing class-based weighted fair queuing. And the deal there is that I'm going to do my step one, which is to classify and then mark my traffic. And this is where QoS policy classes and policy maps are in your router. When you see a, like a QoS policy map, um, this is what we're talking about. I will go in and I will say, OK, I've got these five classes of traffic. I want to make sure that I uh, give at least, let's say, uh, 320K kilobits per second to this queue. And my video queue, oh, maybe that gets two meg. And this third queue transactional traffic, maybe that's going to get a certain amount of bandwidth. And this gets a certain amount of bandwidth. And what's going to happen? And you can do this either by bandwidth 
or you can uh, say, you know, percentage of available bandwidth. There's and there's repercussions on both of those. That gets you know a little into the weeds. But the idea is that as the router is going to choose which piece of traffic is going to go into the hardware queue next, it will rotate through the queues. It's going to take a piece of traffic out of number one, a piece of traffic out of number two, piece of traffic out of number three, piece of traffic out of number four, number five, go back and scroll through weighted fair queuing based on my different classes. This way, all of my um, queues get serviced and they get serviced up to a, you know, a minimum amount that they are guaranteed. I'm guaranteed to make sure that on a healthy basis, 320K of RTP traffic get to go. And I'm going to uh, see to it that up to two megs, maybe this is a, you know, a, a 10 gig link or something like that. So up to two megs of video traffic is always 100% guaranteed. What I'm saying is that I'm going to send it in a timely fashion. I'm going to give enough turns to enough of these different queues. Everybody gets to go. Everybody gets a minimum amount of service. In the event I've serviced everybody and I can still be feeding traffic into the hardware queue, I'll start giving extra turns. But because traffic is bursty, as queue, as traffic is being queued in software, I make sure that everybody gets a turn and they get a minimum amount of service. That sounds awesome, right? Yeah, we don't necessarily do this either. And here's why. RTP traffic has very, very specific parameters for QoS. You want to have no more than um, 150 milliseconds delay from one end to the other. You want no more than 1% um, packet loss and no more than uh, 30 milliseconds of jitter. I've got this 10 gig link here. I'm only guaranteeing for whatever reason, 320K of real time traffic of the, my RTP traffic. As the router is going through and servicing these other queues, RTP traffic starting to build. And because it's starting to build means that it's being delayed. And as soon as it's being delayed, I have a problem. So what we do is something that's a hybrid of these two things. And it is called low latency queuing. Low latency queuing takes your first queue, specifically your RTP traffic, and makes that a priority queue. Remember, we talked about priority queuing. If there's a piece of traffic in there, it goes next. And then we take the rest of these classes and we do class-based weighted fair queuing on it. So what the router will do is there's room for a next piece of traffic in the hardware buffer. It will go to queue number one, this priority queue, look for RTP traffic, send it next. It will go back to the RTP queue, look for another piece of traffic, send it next. And it will continue to do that. It is a priority queue. This queue will get emptied. And then we will start giving turns to the other queues, but only up to a certain amount of bandwidth. Because again, we don't want so much voice traffic to be offered so that I don't get the other services, other queues serviced. So because this first queue is a priority queue, it will always get emptied. My RTP traffic will be handled in a speedy, you know, no packet loss, no jitter kind of way up to a certain amount of bandwidth and everybody else gets serviced on a class basis base a class base a class base on a class right with class based rated for queuing so everybody gets turns when you're talking about call admission control in Cisco Unified Communications Manager and we say that for instance if i'm going from region or um, location A to location B the link of, on it has a certain amount of bandwidth available. What we're talking about is a certain amount of bandwidth available for voice. In locations-based call admission control and call manager, when we identify our links and we put a certain amount of bandwidth on that link as available bandwidth, it's this number that we're gonna put in there. Why? 
because that's the amount that's guaranteed to go in a timely manner. And we don't want to overload that. As soon as I have more than 320 kilobits per second of voice offered to this router, to this egress interface, it's going to get queued. I have in my certain time hacks sent out as much traffic as that queue number one is supposed to get, even though it's a priority queue, then the, you know, if there's any additional traffic, it's going to have to wait until I, the router says to itself, until I service these other queues, and then I'll go back and start giving it turns again, which means it's going to get delayed. And that gets us back to our original problem of too much traffic in a queue. Mar Mar I have a quick question. Are you yes, using sir. 320 as an example, or is that actually the standard for low latency weighted class-based fair care? Or is it is it's just an example. Okay. You know, if right, this is you. a 10 gig link versus a 100 meg link versus a 40 gig link or a 100 gig link versus, you know, a, uh, I don't know, a T1, what this number is going to be is going to be different. Completely configurable. Okay, thank you. Right, 100%, 100%. Okay. Um, I think I have an example of a policy map. Let me see if I can bring it up and I'll show you sort of an example of what that looks like. Remember, I'll make sure I do that. I should have pulled that up already. I didn't think about it until just now. Um, but this is also why uh, you can either do this on a bandwidth basis or you can do this on a percent basis. And I should say commonly, your priority queue for your voice is gonna have a bandwidth statement. I'm gonna guarantee this much bandwidth for RTP traffic, period. And then the remaining traffic will have a percentage. You have up to a certain percentage guaranteed of the remaining bandwidth of the link. And again, if you know I've serviced all the queues, I'll go give extra turns to the queues that have the most traffic remaining. That's the weighted fair queue part of class-based weighted fair queuing. Does that, that help that explain what we're, where we're going with that? Yes, thank you. OK. Um, so we've talked about the hardware queue. We've talked about software queuing. We've talked about the QoS part, classification and marking, putting into queue types of queues. Cool. OK. So um, while I'm thinking about it, give me just a second. And what I'm going to do is um, I should have, come on, there we go. Um, I think I have an example. Give me a second for, oh, where would I find that? I know, because I just saw it yesterday, like an example of a policy map for QoS. Tell you what, let me do a search. Oh, there we are. I knew I had it. So here's an example. Now I'm gonna have access lists, right? Here's an IP access list extended. I'm calling it QoS voice. So it's UDP traffic from anywhere um, where the source, um, the source um, uh, port numbers are in this range to anywhere. And the other thing I'm saying is that part of this access list is it has to be marked with DSCP expedited forwarding. So this is saying if, a Cisco IP phone has um, marked traffic and it's going to be in this port range with this marking goes in this queue. Here's prioritized video. Again, UDP range saying if it's marked AF41. And then I'll talk more about what AF41 is uh, this afternoon when I talk about DSCP values, but it's a very high marking. It's a high priority marking. Um, here's another one, Jabber video, um, AF42, a little less than a, a telepresence endpoint. Here is signaling, anything that's SIP signaling, port 5060, port 5061. And this is a way that I can identify. Notice that this is only identifying the, the, the voice and video. This is not, does not have additional uh, access lists to identify different other kinds of traffic like, you know, and an example might be if you're a, a, you know, a manufacturing firm and you've got robots on your manufacturing floor, the traffic to and from those robots is very high priority. I mean, that's business essential. I would absolutely create an access list or some other way to identify that traffic and make sure that also gets a very high queue. So these access lists here only identify our voice and video traffic but you can have any kind of identification um, method to identify whatever other kinds of traffic are important on your network. 
Okay, so we, we classify. Now I have what's known as a class map. A class map says I am matching a particular uh, marking or a particular identifier. And in our case, hey, if it's in the IP access list QoS voice, or hey, if in a, this is an or, or if it's anything else that's marked expedited forwarding, it's going to be in this class. Uh, I have another class of prioritized video if it matches this particular QoS. So this creates my identifiers. This says which identifiers go with which classes. And then here I'm doing the marking. If it's in the class voice, set your DSCP to expedited forwarding. Anything that's in that first class is going to get marked this way. Prioritize video, mark it this way. Jabber video, mark it this way. Signaling, mark it this way. Everything else, DSCP zero is normal traffic. So we've identified our traffic, we've separated it into classes, and then we have marked the traffic. So, um, and here's some more additional. So here is the policy map for egress queuing. Class voice, if it's in that first class, that voice class, if it's RTP traffic, it is a priority queue and you're getting up to 10% of the available bandwidth. That is one way to do it. You can also say that you're getting a certain amount of, uh, a certain amount of bandwidth. The, the nice part of doing it as all of them as percents is I could apply the same policy map to multiple egress interfaces with different speeds and I'm getting a consistent treatment of my class of my uh, voice across the different ones. If I specify a bandwidth, if I have different speeds on different egress interfaces, then I have to have a separate policy map for each one. And that makes the router think harder. Video gets up to 30% of my bandwidth, everything else gets to uh, 2%. And then there's probably going to be another class, your, your scavenger class, which gets all the remaining. So this is guaranteeing this traffic. And this is just a quick example that the, the, um, uh, the QoS policy maps you're going to have in your own environment are going to be more sophisticated than this. But this is just a quick example. Did this help with regards to the different components of QoS and in you know, how we look at things? Any questions about any of this? Go ahead. No questions, but no it, questions. Is, okay. it does help. Good. OK, awesome. So then, oops, because I'm not done yet here. Here we are. Oops. Ah, one too many. OK. So then, um, what else did I want to say? So we talked about that, talked about that. I think that's about it for the, the, the routers themselves. Um, any other questions about how the routers treat traffic? Everybody good with this so far? Okay. This is just an introduction to terms and concepts. Um, QoS gets a lot more in depth. Uh, if you would like to get, just as a side note, um, a really good explanation of QoS in general, go get the route switch CCIE study guide, that's Cisco press guide. Um, the guy that wrote it, Wendell Odom, is amazing. He has a chapter in there on QoS. It is the best explanation, thorough, concise, and easy to understand that I have ever seen. That's where I like, oh, is that how that works kind of stuff, right? Okay. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, the last sort of uh, thing on our agenda was what about the switches? You know, this is cool on how, oh, I didn't talk about policing and shaping. I knew there was something else. Hold on. All right. Let me talk about policing and shaping real quick. So I am a customer. And I have a circuit to my service provider. And I have purchased, let's say, um, a five meg link, right? I've I, I, a five, um, gosh, that's even old. Let's make it a 50 meg link. I have purchased a 50 megabit per second circuit. That's how much I've paid for. 
My service level agreement says that they will guarantee my 50 megabits per second link. Now, this link, this physical link between us, right, is fiber optic cable. Could I technically send faster than 50 megabits per second on a fiber optic cable? Oh, yeah, you betcha. You know, I've got a, I've got a, um, a, a you know, an SFP there that'll send faster than that. Can I send? Sure. Oh, but what's the service provider going to do with that? The service provider has a lot of customers and they've got a big network. And they have guaranteed to me 50 megabits per second. What if I send to them faster than that? What happens? Well, on an ingress basis, they're going to need to pay attention to how much traffic I'm sending them. That's number one. And then anything that exceeds what I've paid for, the service provider is going to need to do something. Their choices are to drop excess traffic. They call it violating traffic. I've, I've conformed to this. Um, this is violate traffic. I just violate it. If you send me faster than 50 megabits per second, I'm not even going to bother trying to send it anywhere. I'm just going to drop it. Or they could say, well, you know, I've, I've guaranteed from a, you know, high marking QoS perspective, 50 megabits per second, but I'm going to allow you to burst up to a certain amount, um, but I'm going to remark that lower. Anything that exceeds traffic, You're, you've paid for 50 meg, you know, you, you're bursting, so you just happen to send me, you know, 52 megabits per second during this time hack. I'll go, yeah, okay, service provider says, I'll go ahead and accept that traffic, but I'm going to remark it at a lower QoS priority level. I won't guarantee that traffic for you. This is policing. Generally speaking, policing is done on ingress interfaces, generally. And what we're doing is we're saying, you know, we're being the traffic cop. You know, I've, you've paid for 50 meg. I don't, you know, if you send me faster than that, uh, you know, you haven't paid for it. That's policing. Okay. Well, then me over here, this behooves me to not send faster than 50 megabits per second. So, you know, let's say I've got, you know, 50 megabits per second is here. The traffic being offered to this interface is going to be, you know, bursty. I don't want to send faster than the circuit is going to accept. So I can, I can delay that traffic. I can cue that traffic and smooth it out, that shaping. Shaping is done on egress interfaces. And it's the idea that even though I technically could send faster, I am not going to. I am going to hold traffic and feed it out when I have the opportunity to do so, which absolutely, yes, is going to mean that I, there's going to be a certain amount of delay in some of this traffic until I can feed it out. And this is where we get into things like our low latency queuing. It's one thing for the, the router to hold on to the traffic. It's another thing for, for it to choose what goes next. But that's where policing and shaping come in. Policing and shaping allow me to not overload a circuit. The service provider may be saying, I'll only guarantee 50 meg, and I'll only guarantee 2 meg of voice and video traffic. OK, can I have sort of two shapes and you know feed out of those? Yeah. Um, so those two terms, policing and shaping. QoS, once you are implementing it on your network, is uh, an end-to-end -end kind of thing. You know, to your point, do you know soft clients uh, mark traffic? Yes, they do. Do my Cisco IP phones, hard phones mark traffic? Yes, they do. Can switches mark traffic? They actually can. Can they remark traffic? They absolutely do. Um, routers will identify and mark traffic, and then how the traffic is treated as it flows through my network is QoS. One last note about that before I talk about the switches is the following. Um, I've been telling my students this for ages, and I, I want to say it to you because 
with this topic in particular, this is really important. Everybody who is in networking these days needs to go learn some programming. Go learn Python, go learn um, Perl, go learn JSON, you know, API writing. Go learn some kind of programming. It's going to be essential. With QoS in particular, it used to be that it would take an experienced engineer, you know, a week to identify, you know, go look at all the different traffic and all the different devices and, you know, evaluate, well, do I need to tweak it here or set it up there, blah, 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 and go and make those changes, right? Um, it was a substantial undertaking. Algorithms can do it in seconds. Who is doing the algorithms? Programmers. So go learn some programming because things like QoS is now being handled in real time by monitoring software and it is doing these things sort of on the fly and adjusting things on the fly and it's going to be programmers are going to be doing that it's important to know what they're doing this is definitely important stuff but the implementation of it if you're thinking oh cool i want to be a qos engineer go learn some programming um any quick questions on um policing and shaping before i talk about switches everybody good actually one quick i don't know if there's a question or a statement sure. so is it true uh, so I have QoS all the way through my network, mm -hmm. but I hit the uh, service provider and they don't honor or the MPLS doesn't honor QoS, everything drops to best effort. Potentially, yes. Now, yeah, because there is no QoS on the internet unless you pay for it on some kind of a private network. Um, now that said, the internet is not going to remark they, they're going to they're going to mark at layer two because basically the uh, like the internet just doesn't pay attention to layer three QoS markings. Um, so they'll slap on their layer twos and off their layer twos, and you know they you know the, your service provider might pay attention to layer two markings like an MPLS cloud kind of thing, sure. But you know on your site in your environment, you mark it layer three. It goes through the internet. Once it gets to your um, the, the the you know the other side of the VPN between your site and your the other site in your company, your other site you know because you control those routers again can start paying attention to those layer three markings. So yes, any network that you do not directly control does not have to pay attention to anything. Um, any uh, network that you flow IP traffic through should not be altering the IP header itself, you know, um, but um, they can, they can choose to. Does that, does that answer your question or did I sort of skirt the issue? I'm not sure if I answered that directly. Um, well, uh, I'm kind of old school at this. So my, my for instance, uh, the old switches, I could drop in auto QoS and so on and have a lot of this stuff done. But if the router that I'm trying to send the traffic through doesn't have any type of QoS values assigned to it, then I've lost my markings. Correct or not correct? That, that one's always kind of left me a little gray. So... Two answers. First answer is going to be there is no QoS on the internet unless you pay for it. And number two, okay, I mean internally. I, uh, I, I internally, if you have if you have a router that is not configured for QoS inside your network, it should not be going in and altering the markings. It won't pay attention to them. It'll just do best effort first in, first out. It actually does weighted fair queuing natively, but it's not going to pay attention. But neither should it change again unless you program it to. Okay. The markings. So the markings will be preserved, at least the layer three markings will be preserved through that router to whatever the next hop is. Okay. Right? Because the router routers, generally speaking, don't alter the IP header. They pay attention to the IP header, but they don't alter it unless you tell it to. Okay. Yeah. I was always told they would just wipe them out. So that's why I was kind of curious. Thank you. You know, switches will. And actually, that brings up. <laughs> Drop my pen. Uh, that brings up the thing. It switches will though. Layer two markings. So let's talk about switches a little bit. So I have a Cisco IP phone and I have that connected to a switch. And let's say at another port, I've got a PC. And let's say that I've got at another port, I've got a phone and then daisy chain to the phone is a PC. 
And then let's say I've got a Cisco IP phone with a PC on it, and that PC has a Jabber client. So I've got these four ports on the switch. Now let's take the case of this, just the Cisco IP phone itself. Now we already said that at layer three, your Cisco IP phone will mark the DSCP values in the IP header, excuse me, and um, uh, we send that traffic so that downstream layer three devices can pay attention. At layer two, in the 802.1Q header, there's the toss bits, there's three bits, or cost bits, there's three bits there, and the phone can mark it. There's seven different values, and um, a certain combination of those three bits mean it's high priority traffic for the switch. So the phone's going to mark it at layer two, send it over to the switch, and the first thing the switch is going to do is wipe that out and remark it at zero normal traffic. That is because the switch will do that with all traffic. All traffic coming in from all of these sources by default will get remarked at class of service zero at the switch. It'll wipe out those layer two markings. Well, that's not awesome because I do have an uplink to a router and I maybe I do need to prioritize uh, with the traffic that goes up there. Or maybe this is a multi-layer switch, and based on what the switch knows, it can tell the router what to do, you know, it can inform the, the routing process in the switch about what to do. So I don't necessarily want to wipe that out. This is a trust boundary. Oops, boundary, right. Now, in the case of a regular old PC, do I want the trust boundary to be here? Yeah. You know, I, I, the, a random PC, you know, is sending me traffic and, you know, me the switch. You know, if they're marking their layer two stuff, I don't want to believe that. If QoS is required, I will let the downstream layer three devices do the paying attention and marking and classifying and all that good stuff. But the switch itself at layer two, it's a layer two device at layer two, is going to um, wipe out that layer two stuff. Well, what about a Cisco IP phone? Doesn't the switch want to trust the Cisco phone? But yeah. So can I move the trust boundary to, let's say, here? Yeah. So now my trust boundary is here. I'm going to trust what the, the Cisco IP phone sends me. There's a command I can add to this port. Uh, it's um, uh, COS, QoS, trust, Cisco IP phone, or so. I don't remember the exact syntax of it. But effectively, what I'm doing is I'm telling the switch, the layer two process in the switch, to trust the layer two marking from the downstream device, providing it's a Cisco IP phone. Remember when Cisco IP phones boot, they have a conversation with the switch about, you know, in you know, CDP or LLDP, and we'll say, hey, I'm a phone. And the switch will go, you're a phone? Okay, cool. I have been told to trust the downstream device providing it's a phone. So now those layer two markings will be maintained. The switch can pay attention and pass them along on a layer two basis. Well, what about a Cisco IP phone? And again, it's going to set the trust boundary here. Um, this, the, the Cisco IP phone itself has a three port switch in it, and it can do, just like this switch can do, it can do markings or remarkings as well for the layer two information. The port that's going to go into the switch itself is one of the three ports and that, you know, what it's sending out there is going to be trusted. The other port in the switch goes into the brain of the phone itself. But the third port in the switch, that the one internal port is logical, so you only see the two ports on the physical phone. Um, but guess what? What's the, what's the phone going to do? It's going to remark any traffic coming in from the PC. So I've got this random PC over here, and the random PC says, "Oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I just took a QoS class, and I'm going to go into my PC and use some kind of program and mark all of my traffic." Um, you know, class of service five, which is what phone traffic should go at, uh, because I'm an, I'm an intrepid student and I'm just going to do that. 
The phone has a three port switch. Like any other layer two device by default, it's going to remark all that layer two traffic at class of service zero, normal traffic. So the trust boundary is still here at the IP phone and it will remark what the PC sends. So then you ask, well, what if I've got a Jabber client or a Cisco IP communicator um, downstream of this phone? And this could be a telepresence endpoint too, but you know, the Cisco IP phone, can I extend the trust boundary? You can. There are um, um, uh, commands I can put on the phone itself to trust what's, you know, tell it not to remark basically. And I can also um, have the phone identify the fact that um, it is a Jabber client and there's CDP happening here, providing their CDP has been installed or LLDP has been installed here on the, the PC. The phone will understand that this downstream device, this PC, because of CDP or LLDP has a, a phone device on it. And then it will you know, extend that trust. Basically the phone will, be will understand it should not remark the traffic. So this stuff goes into the switch. So, the idea behind switch QoS is there are three class of service bits, three bits, in the 802.1Q tag uh, um, header, the, the, the VLAN header, the, the piece in the, the Ethernet header that's the VLAN, right? Um, three bits in there, has seven total values from zero to zero to seven, or eight total values, zero to seven. Five is as high as we go. And your phone traffic, um, like your Cisco IP phone will mark at layer two, those class of service bits to be a five. Switches by default, their trust boundary is their edge. So they will remark any traffic coming in to, from layer two at your class of service will mark everything back to zero. Switches can have the trust boundary extended to Cisco IP phones, but the IP phone itself is a switch and therefore will remark traffic coming in from a PC unless it's told not to. So Perry, was that you asking about the, um, the does everything get remarked or was, was that somebody else? Who would just ask that question about everything getting remarked? Did he leave? Okay. All right. Well, hopefully I answered that question. Um, and that is um, what I have about for, for this conversation. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I was here. I just. Oh. <laughs> I thought so, but I wasn't sure. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and thank you. Yes, it did answer. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So that's all I have. Any, any questions that I can answer about terms you've heard or concepts that aren't quite clear or layer two versus layer three. I haven't really got in, gotten into any of the commands or anything because this is just a, a, a terms and concepts conversation, but is there anything else you guys would like to know or like to see? Um, thanks for coming and um, I'll see you next time.